This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, a brief history. Hi, I'm Rebecca, and this is the next episode of A Brief History. On this episode, I share the knowledge of PhD candidate Johanna Strong on the final days of Queen Mary I. Mary I, England's first crowned Queen Regnant, who reigned from July 1553 to 1558, died at St. James's Palace on Thursday, November 17, 1558, at the age of 43. Having reigned for five years, four months, and 11 days, according to chronicler Hollinshed and his co-author's calculations. Susan Abernethy of the Freelance History Writer provides a concise timeline of Mary's final illness. In August 1558, Mary suffered from a fever and dropsy, a swelling of the body, so badly that she was moved from Hampton Court Palace to the Palace of St. James's. By September, her symptoms had worsened, and she now also suffered from headaches and periods of confusion. Her fever came and went in waves, as did her depressive episodes. By October, Mary knew she was dying, and on October 28th, she made final amendments to her will, acknowledging that she would not pass the crown and throne to heirs of her own body. It was around this time that Philip II of Spain, Mary's husband, sent a physician from Spain to care for her, having been informed of the gravity of Mary's illness. He was not at her side, having left England a few years previous and returning only briefly in 1557 to gain Mary's support for a Habsburg war against France. In her final days, many members of the court abandoned Mary to court Elizabeth's favor at Hatfield. Elizabeth having been recognized as Mary's heir earlier in Mary's final illness. During her final weeks, Mary, ever a devout Catholic, passed her time praying for salvation, sleeping, and recounting her dreams to the loyal servants who had remained at her bedside. We know that she was at least comforted during this difficult time by her faith and by her dreams of children playing and singing in front of her. Early in the morning, on November 17th, Mary heard Mass before quietly succumbing to her illness. She died so peacefully that at first her attendants thought that she had simply passed into a short period of better health, as she had done so frequently during the past few months. Despite being a momentous historical figure, much of what we popularly know about Mary I's death comes from works published significantly after her death and not in the following few days or months as we would expect following the death of a monarch in the modern era. As a result of the delayed accounts, there is a level of uncertainty as the narratives in London merchant and citizen Henry Machen's diary, Raphael Hollinshed and his co-authors Chronicle, John Fox's Acts and Monuments, and Francis Bacon's Annals of England show. While the Chronicle, Machen's Diary, and Risley's A Chronicle of England during the reigns of the Tudors from 1485 to 1559, note that Mary died between the hours of 5 or 6 in the morning. Acts and Monuments recalls that it was about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. There are a vast number of unknowns relating to Mary's death largely because it's very difficult to historically diagnose patients. The cause of her death is therefore uncertain, but it's been narrowed down to complications from influenza or even uterine or ovarian cancer. The hypothesis that Mary died of influenza fits with Hollinshed and his co-authors, near contemporary account of her death which recounts Mary being, in September 1558, sick with a hot burning fever, which sickness was common that year through all the realm and consumed a marvelous number. This sickness then continued from September until her death on November 17th. On the other hand, Fox's Acts and Monuments gives evidence that Mary perhaps died of cancer in the reproductive organs, 
saying as he does that, quote, some say that she died of a tippany, unquote, an internal growth, which in Mary's case had been developing throughout 1558, and which had extended her abdomen and caused her physicians and Mary herself to believe she was pregnant. Francis Bacon also recounts in his later Annals of England, first published in the early 1620s, that Mary's liver was, quote, over-cooled, unquote. In his words, by a mole, which had been developed into a dropsy, which Bacon believes could have led to the belief that she was pregnant. Hollinshed and his co-authors, Fox and Bacon, agree, though, that Mary's death was hastened by a period of depression. She had conceived an inward sorrow of mind, says Hollinshed and his co-authors, and Fox concurs, saying that since Mary did much sighing before her death, many supposed she died of thought and sorrow. While this is a clear indication that Mary was outwardly struggling with her mental health, though, of course, no one at the time would have used that term, the cause remains a little, or a lot, biased, since both Hollinshed and Fox say that her depression was caused by the loss of Calais earlier in 1558. It is in Fox's account that we see Mary's now famous phrase, When I am dead and opened, you shall find Calais lying in my heart. On the afternoon of Tuesday, December 12, 1558, Mary's body was moved from St. James's to Westminster Abbey, where she was to be buried, according to the request set forth in her will. On her coffin lay her funeral effigy, a life-size wooden figure of Mary, wearing her royal robes and a gold crown, which can still be seen today, minus the royal regalia, in the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Galleries at Westminster Abbey. Once at the Abbey, Mary's body was placed in a hearse, what we today would recognize more as an awning or a canopy, and laid there overnight. On December 14th, a requiem mass was said, part of the funeral proceedings which cost approximately 7,700 pounds overall, or about four and a half million pounds today. Following the mass, Mary was once again moved this time to her final resting place in the Henry VII Lady Chapel. She was left buried in an unmarked tomb covered by desacralized altar stones dismantled in the religious changes overseen by Elizabeth in the early years of her reign. Mary had also requested that she be buried with her mother, Catherine of Aragon, but that, too, never happened. When Elizabeth was reburied on James VI of Scotland, James I of England, orders in 1606, Mary found herself buried underneath her sister Elizabeth's coffin, having been placed on top of Mary's in the burial vault. Only one line on the entire tomb is dedicated to Mary's memory. In the words, partners in throne and grave, here we rest Elizabeth and Mary, sisters in the hope of the resurrection. An effigy of Mary doesn't appear on the tomb either, with only Elizabeth appearing in effigy. The glory Mary held as the first crowned queen regnant of England was not, and is not, reflected in her resting place, a sad memorial to the queen who provided the precedent for Elizabeth I, Mary II, Anne, Victoria, and Elizabeth II. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.